Thank you for attending our Silicon Valley Reads event here at West Valley College. The theme of Silicon Valley Reads this year is Homeland and Home, the Immigrant Experience. My name is Mary Ann Mills. I'm the Instruction and Outreach <coughs> Librarian here at West Valley Campus. And um, on behalf of the college, I welcome you and author Christina Enriquez to our campus. Ms. Enriquez will read a short passage of the Book of Unknown Americans and then be interviewed by Paulette Boudreau, one of our English faculty. A little bio first on both of these women. Paulette, our interviewer, uh, is a West Valley College instructor here in English, and she is also a fiction writer with works published in both national and international literary journals. Her first length work, a novel, is forthcoming in fall 2015. <laughs> Our guest, Christina Enriquez, earned her undergraduate degree from Northwestern University and is a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop. The Book of Unknown Americans was one of the 100 most notable books of 2014 by the New York Times. She is also the author of The World in Half and Come Together, Fall Apart, a novella and stories, which was a New York Times Editor's Choice selection. Her stories have been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Glimmer, Glimmer Train, The American Scholar, Plowshares, Triquarterly, and AGNI, along with the anthology This Is Not Chick Lit, original stories by America's best women writers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Christina Enriquez. Hi guys, thanks for um Coming out, you had to bear with me a little bit. I'm a little bit under the weather, so um, I'm trying, you know, to rally for you guys <laughs> here. But um, yeah, I thought I would just start by reading um, one passage from the book, um, and then I think we're going to have a little bit of a conversation, and then hopefully you have time to open it up to questions from you guys. So if you have anything that you've come wanting to discuss, either about the book or if you want to know a little bit more about me and my background or anything about being a writer, um, you know, I'm all yours for the next hour. So um, the section that I'm going to read for you, I think kind of all you need to know is that it's narrated by a 16-year-old boy whose name is Mayor Toro. And Mayor is a boy whose parents have brought him from Panama to the United States when he was young. Um, and he has fallen in love with this girl who's moved into their building. And the girl's name is Maribel. And she suffered a brain injury the year before in Mexico. And so her parents have brought her to the United States to get her the kind of education and the kind of care that she needs in order to get better. Um, <clears throat> there's actually 11 different narrators in the book. Um, and all of them live in one apartment building together in Delaware. And this is the one scene, I think, in the book where everybody is all together in one space at one time. So. We rode the bus to midnight mass with the Riveras. The bus driver tuned the radio to the all Christmas music station. And when Feliz Navidad came on, I guess since we were the only people on the bus, he raised the volume and shouted back at us, here you go. A little piece of home for you. Under his breath, my dad said, every year the same thing. If it's in Spanish, it's a piece of home. Well, I never heard this song until I came to the United States. <laughs> and every year you complain, my mom said. You like this song? No. It's like how everyone thinks I like tacos, my dad said. We don't even eat tacos in Panama. That's right. We eat chicken and rice, my mom said. And seafood, my dad added. Corvina as fresh as God makes it. This was one of the few things that could unite my parents. The thread that mended them. Their conviction that no one else here understood Panama the way they did. I was sitting in front of them with my feet up on my seat. My dress socks pulled halfway up my calves. I had my coat zipped to my chin so that my mom wouldn't see I wasn't wearing my tie. The Riveras were across the aisle from us. I like tacos, I offered. 
my mom's side. Why would you say such a thing? What about you, Moneybell? I asked. Do you like tacos? When she didn't answer, I repeated the question louder. She was pressing the pad of her thumb against her incisors. She said, my teeth are really sharp. So you could eat a crunchy taco, I asked. OK, she said. My mom swatted my shoulder. Leave her alone, she said. I was just asking if she liked tacos. I don't know what that means, my mom said. Tacos, it means tacos. I don't know if you mean something else by it now, all this taco talk. That made me laugh. And as soon as I laughed, I realized I hadn't done it in a long time, too long. And I remembered how good it felt, how it made my muscles warm and filled me up with the kind of lightness that was usually missing in my life, the kind of lightness that was buried under my parents' bickering and under my awkwardness at school. I stared out the window into the dark at the illuminated trail of streetlights streaking through the air and laughed while everyone else on the bus stayed quiet. The next morning, my mom brewed a pot of Café Ruiz, our annual treat, and brought out the rosca bread with almonds that she'd made the night before. Our apartment was decked out with the same tired decoration she displayed every year. Angel figurines on the end tables, a crocheted snowman cozy that slid over the extra roll of toilet paper in the bathroom, a dried wreath with a red velvet bow that she hung over the kitchen doorway, a porcelain nativity scene on the floor. We hadn't gotten a tree and, as threatened, I didn't get any presents. Enrique didn't exactly get a mountain of stuff either unless a four pack of deodorant and a new Gillette razor counted. Besides him, the only person who got a gift was my mom, and it was nothing more than a lousy set of shampoo and conditioner that my dad swore he bought at the salon, even though anyone could see from the sticker on the back that he'd gotten it from the clearance shelf at Kohl's. My mom placed the set on the coffee table. None of us mentioned the sticker. Late in the morning, the radiators died, and my dad did what he always did, kick them and curse until he gave up and plopped down on the couch. Not long after, the telephone rang. It was Senora Rivera calling my mom to tell her that the heat was out and to ask what they were supposed to do. My mom told her just to wait, that it would come back on eventually. The Riveras? My dad asked from the couch when my mom hung up the phone. I bet they're freezing their asses off. We never thought they would leave Mexico for this, I'm sure. We should invite them over, I said. Why? my mom asked. I seized up. Why? It wasn't like we had heat either. What was I going to say? Just because I wanted to see Maribel? Because I bought her a present about a month ago? A red scarf that had cost me basically all of my allowance and that I'd wrapped in tissue paper and had been keeping under my bed for her? And now that I was grounded, I didn't know how I was going to get it to her? We should invite everyone over, I said. The whole building. More body heat will warm everyone up. Genius, Enrique said sarcastically. But when Senora Rivera called again at noon, concerned because the apartment was getting colder by the minute, my mom told them to stop by. Then she hung up and dialed Nelia and Kiske and told them to spread the word. She pulled out every candle we owned and lit match after match until the wicks were all burning with tiny flames. It's pretty like this, don't you think, she said. And I had to admit, it did look nice. Before she could brew another pot of coffee, people were knocking on our door, wishing us Merry Christmas, and gripping bottles of rum in their gloved hands. Everyone kept their coats and hats on. Micho brought his camera, roaming around the apartment, snapping pictures of everyone who was already there. Benny flashing the peace sign. Nelia sitting cross-legged on the couch. Kiske is sitting next to her, pretending like she wasn't interested in having her photo taken. When the Rivera showed up, Micho bunched the three of them together in front of our door and made them pose while he snapped a shot. Maribel stared right at the camera, but she didn't smile, so I went up behind Micho, waving my arms and making goofy faces to see if she would react. When she cracked a grin, Micho said, there we go, 
That was a good one. Not long after, Jose Mercado and his wife Inez showed up, her gripping his elbow while he hobbled with his walker. Gustavo had to work, Benny told my dad, even though my dad hadn't asked. Movie theater might be the only place that's open on Christmas Day. Hollywood doesn't believe in God, my dad said. Benny laughed. But God sure believes in Hollywood. Have you seen those women, Megan Fox, and the mouth on Angelina Jolie? God is in the details, man. My dad raised his beer. Salud! Despicable, Kiskeya said. Even our landlord, Pito Mosquito, stopped by long enough to poke his head in the front door and announce that Del Marva was on their way to fix the heat. Don't blame me, he said. Don't worry, Micho shouted. We won't blame you. We'll just deduct it from our rent checks this month. Pito wagged his finger and a few people laughed. Micho said, we're just teasing you, man. Come on inside. The radiators didn't kick back on until late that night. But with all the people packed into our apartment, it started to feel a little more like Christmas. Everyone shivering and laughing and drinking and talking. When we ran out of coffee, my mom mixed up huge pots of hot cocoa that she made from heavy cream and some chocolate bars she found in the back of a cabinet and melted down. Senor Rivera asked if she had cinnamon sticks to put in the cups to make it Mexican style, and my mom found a jar of powdered cinnamon that she sprinkled into the pot. <coughs> Are you happy now? She joked. It always has to be the Mexican way. Mexico, Mexico, as if the rest of us don't exist. Viva Mexico, Micho shouted from the corner of the room. Mexico, Senor Rivera said. Panama, my dad said. Presente, my mom said. And everyone laughed. Nicaragua, Benny shouted. Presente. Puerto Rico, Jose said. Presente, Inez and Nelia chimed at the same time. Venezuela, shouted Quisquea, presente. Paraguay, said Fito, presente. Then, Feliz Navidad came on the radio. This goddamn song again, my dad said. Oh, come on, my mom said. She started singing along and swishing her hips while my dad eyed her skeptically. What, she said, you don't want to dance with me? Fine, Benny, Benny. And Benny took my mom by the hand, spinning her around. Inez and Jose joined in, Jose leaning on his walker while he rocked back and forth. And Micho pulled Nelia up off the couch into a twirl. Almost everyone in the room started singing along, and eventually my dad put his drink down and cut in on Benny and my mom, sliding his arm around her waist. Now this is more like it, my dad yelled above the noise. This is like the Christmases I knew. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now for the uh, <laughs> sort of the interview part of, uh, at least part of the interview part of it. And uh, we will allow some time at the end so that you guys, audience, who have questions can also uh, ask Christina, you know, what you want to know. Um, my first thought after listening to Christina read the passage that she chose, uh, one of the things that I noted in the novel is this um, real collection of Latino, Latina uh, people from all around uh, the different parts of the, uh, of the world, really. <clears throat> and this notion of um, having them all gather in one place and in a place that is um, not something that we generally think about when we think about the Latino, Latina uh, immigrant population in America. We generally think about um, California, so the West Coast. We think about the Southwest. Uh, we think maybe about uh, New York, right? But she's gathered these folks in, uh, in Delaware. And so one of the questions I had was about the point and purpose of that. Why Delaware, as opposed to um, the places that ordinarily we would think about? Because Delaware is a kind of place that um, basically I remember it from my elementary school <laughs> geography classes, right? And so I'm assuming that you had a particular reason for um, placing them in a place that is kind of un not unknown to us, 
but is not so familiar in terms of the population that the novel is focused on? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, besides the fact that I just knew that everybody was desperately waiting for the great Delaware novel. <laughs> I, I mean, I was born in Delaware, so I moved around a lot as a kid, um, but it was mostly, I was born in Delaware and then moved back there when I was in like fifth grade. Mm -hmm. So I mostly grew up there. It's a place that I feel really connected to, and that's how the whole thing started, really. I just wanted to write a place that I knew the best. Um, but then about halfway through writing a draft of the book, I mentioned to somebody that it was set in Delaware, mm -hmm. and she was very surprised to hear that, and she said something along the lines of, you know, but is there any, like, big Latino population in Delaware? Like, she didn't know um, that that would be true. And the fact is that there really is, and it, it gets explicated in the book a little bit, and the reason is because there's these mushroom farms across the state line in Pennsylvania who traditionally have brought in laborers from Puerto Rico and then from Mexico, and eventually people started setting down roots um, not only in Pennsylvania, but across the line in Delaware. Um, and there's, you know, real sizable communities now. But the fact that she was surprised made me realize that it was important to keep the book set in Delaware, specifically because of that, you know? Um, and exactly what you said, it's because people tend to hear this kind of story, any kind of story about immigrants, and they immediately associate it geographically with a place like Arizona or Texas or California, you know, and they don't think necessarily that this is a story that's happening in a place like Delaware. Um, but the fact is that it is, and it's happening in every pocket of the country. Um, and it's really just an American story. It also ended up sort of going with a lot of the themes of the book about certain, um, you know, people being overlooked, um, not really being fully known. You know, like when I tell people I'm from Delaware, like usually people have no idea what to say. <laughs> They're like, oh, you're the first person I've met from Delaware. Or like once in a while someone will have driven on I-95, you know, through Delaware and they say something like that. But um, most people don't know a lot about it as a state. Um, so it actually sort of ended up going with a lot of the themes mm -hmm. of the book, too, to have it in this kind of out-of-the-way place. But it was really fun for me because, you know, I got to put in all these places and all these things that I had, like, grown up around and, um, I don't know, you know, just like my favorite sub shop, Capriati's, you know, it's like, oh, I get to put Capriati's in the book, that's so exciting. So it was just, it was a fun thing to do. Okay, very good. Um, I was also uh, thinking about and wondering about the um, the notion of the um, the children or the young people within the story and the connections that, um, that I saw between um, the relationships between the young people in some ways sort of reflected or mirrored in the relationships with the adults but in general it seemed that the the central focus was on the young people and that there was a way that they kind of, uh, as a result of the, what they were doing and how they chose to make their decisions, the, the adults were affected by that and also the adults made a lot of the choices and decisions about where they would be and what they would do based on the, the needs of the children or their perceived ideas of the needs of the children. So what is the, the real um, focus and the point that you were wanting to make in having the young people be so central to the, the events, really, the sort of key events of the novel? Um, I, think, I don't think I was thinking about it quite in those terms. I mean, that's an interesting reading of it. Um, and I do think you're right that there are some parallels that exist in some of the relationships there. Um, I, I felt, I guess, I had the instinct from the beginning that I wanted to write a diverse book, but not only diverse in terms of all the countries that the characters were from, but also I wanted to write one character who was a 16-year-old boy, and then the other main narrator mm -hmm. is a woman who's, you know, older, has, you know, a 15-year-old girl of her own. 
um, you know, married, just a completely different like generation. And I guess that was part of the diversity aspect for me too. Um, but I think the reason, the whole book started for me with Mayor, who's the 16 year old boy. And I think to the extent that maybe they, Mayor and Maribel feel central to the book, mm -hmm. that's why. It's because the whole thing grew out of them and their relationship. And I'm always just a sucker for a love story. And so I just, you know, wrote these two. And they seemed like an unlikely pair in so many ways. And that's why I think I sort of um, got captivated by them and their story. Um, but yeah, it all was an outgrowth of just first having the voice of Mayor in my head. Um, I mean, the, the book really started because I had a single a sentence that just came to me one day, and the sentence was, we heard they were from Mexico. And that's all I had. And it's the first line of Mayor's first chapter now. <coughs> but I kind of just kept pushing that line out. Eventually, that line grew into a short story that was just about my and Maribel. Mm -hmm. And eventually that story grew into a novel, which is this. So I added all of the other characters, Alma and all of the other neighbors who live in their building much later in the process. Um, and so I think, yeah, my and Maribel were always just the central ones for me, but not because I was trying to like say anything about mm -hmm. generation, just because I was naturally attracted to them and that story. It's very interesting. Um, and I'm wondering also, like, the um, dynamic between the different narrators that you have. And actually the question comes about the choice to have uh, multiple narrators. So as you mentioned earlier, the key narrators are Alma and Mayor. And then we have all of the other folks who have their own chapters and get to tell their own stories. And, um, and so I'm wondering about well, the two pieces, why the choice to have multiple perspectives and as opposed to you could have kept it in Mayor's voice. Right. You could have told everyone's, given us details about everyone's life. Um, but why the choice to have multiple perspectives? And then uh, what were some of the challenges that were part of or a result of having to speak from different voices? Um. I think the reason that I ended up with these multiple perspectives is that I had something sort of just churning in my brain at the same time that I was writing the book. And that was, I guess I was thinking a lot and noticing a lot about the news stories that we seem to be getting about immigrants, and in particular about Latino immigrants. And the news stories, to me, by and large, seem to be about like either the threat that immigrants were somehow posing to the quote unquote American way of life, mm -hmm. or they were um, stories about that were covering basically like certain crimes that immigrants had committed. Mm -hmm. And that was like kind of the extent of it in, in the you know kind of mass narrative of the country. Mm -hmm. And I was like really sick of hearing those stories because I was like, there's a whole nother set of stories, clearly. And why are we telling those stories? You know, it just seemed absurd to me. Um, so my dad is an immigrant. He came from Panama to the United States in 1971. And he came um, with a student visa in his hand. He was going to study chemical engineering at the University of Delaware. And he ended up moving in down the street from my mom, who weirdly had been to Panama the year before as a foreign exchange student. So when he moved in down the street, her mom said to her, why don't you go introduce yourself to the nice Panamanian boy who just moved in? And she did, and my mom was majoring in Spanish, and my dad needed to learn English, and they helped each other with their studies, and you know, it was kind of like the rest is history. So my dad, they ended up getting married, and my dad ended up staying here, even though he had planned just to get his degree and go back to Panama. And now he's been here for more than 40 years. He's the vice president of a company where he's worked his entire career. Um, you know, he and my mom had me and my brother and sister, and we've all gone on to do successful things. And it's like, no one was telling that story. And it was because it's not particularly spectacular in any way. You know, it's a very ordinary story. And precisely because of that, though, 
I thought that's why it's important to me to tell it as a fiction writer, you know? Like, I'm interested in ordinary stories. Um, so I didn't tell my dad's story exactly, but the spirit of the book suddenly sort of became for me about finding a way to tell ordinary stories. And I wanted to tell kind of as many of them as I could. And so I just ended up crowding all of those neighbors in and giving them all a chance to tell their story, basically. Um, it, it, it's interesting, though, the way I did, it took me like five years to write this book, and I think about 20 different drafts. And in early stages, I had it set up a little bit structurally differently, which was that I had my yard actually be given a school assignment about immigration and that he, for his assignment, he would have to go around to the people in his building and interview them mm -hmm. and ask them their stories. Um, and then that's how I initially wrote all of them. And then we just ended up dropping that whole conceit. It was like, you kind of didn't need it after a while. It was okay just to let the stories hang out there and just appear periodically mm -hmm. as the rest of the story was unfolding. You didn't really need the frame of, you know, um, his assignment to be holding up that part of the book. So we just kind of let that go. But that's kind of how it started, um, the idea that really everyone would tell these stories. But I, I was really just trying to figure out a way how to get it in because I had been thinking so much about, I mean, basically how shameful it is that we don't tell those stories and that we don't give each other the space to listen to those stories. Yes. Yeah, that's an important piece. Um, I was thinking about that too as I was reading the novel. This. Um, the way that in America most of what we hear, what we get from the popular media, is the stories of the folks who are undocumented. And uh, what I noticed in the novel is that most of the people, in fact, I think all of the main uh, characters that we met were all documented people. And, um, and that became, to a certain extent, a, um, a source of pride mm -hmm. for the characters themselves. And so it was interesting to, to notice the, the um, what what I've heard um, frequently, actually, about all immigrant groups, or about many immigrant groups, I guess I should say, that um, immigrants will sometimes be more American <laughs> than Americans who are, you know, a hundred generations here, so to speak. That there is a, a pride and a real um, effort to embrace, you know, the various traditions while still trying to maintain something of a sense of identity, of loyalty to um, original identity. And so I was wondering if, uh, if that was an intention as you were writing the book, that wanting to show the lives, as you said, of the ordinary folk, um, and also wanting to kind of highlight that notion that, um, that people do um, maintain their identities. They also have a wish and a desire to um, become a part of the sort of American, um, and when we talk about American, in this case we're talking sort of the European American mm -hmm. foundation that we have. Yeah, um, I mean you brought up a lot of interesting things there. In that. I mean, one thing I'll say is in terms of documented, undocumented, um, one decision I made early on was to have the Riveras come here legally mm -hmm. to have gotten all of their paperwork in order, waited an awfully long time before they were allowed to come here, but to them as characters it was really important that they do it that way. And for me, narratively, it was really important because, well one thing was I was trying to make the book bulletproof. And, what I was try and when I say that, I mean anyone who was going to come to the book with any kind of anti-immigrant feeling, and you know, because people like to say this, like, I'm not against immigrants, I'm just against illegal immigrants. Right. So it's like, okay, well, here you go, they're documented, mm -hmm. so now what's your problem? You know, like, carry on. <laughs> and they go through the book, and the thing was, I knew that I wanted them to lapse out of status mm -hmm. over the course of the book, and that that would also be important. But that by that time, your sympathy would be so entrenched with them mm -hmm. and what they were going through and what they were trying to do for their daughter um, that you couldn't help, hopefully, 
but sort of question to yourself, like, oh, now what do I think about someone who's here undocumented? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yes. to possibly change your mind or at least mm -hmm. make you reconsider that. Mm -hmm. Because that's, you know, a very typical scenario that people come here with paperwork. It's not just, you know, people jumping a fence or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's that people have come here with a certain visa and the visa lapses out of status mm -hmm. and through no fault of their own, the economy at the time that the book is happening basically just falls off a cliff. Arturo can't get another job, you know, and mm -hmm. so now they're in this position. And they even have this really poignant conversation, Alma and Arturo, where they're saying to each other, now we're one of those people. Mm -hmm. And they feel so badly about yes. it, you yeah. know? When I read that, I had the impression that um, that they were kind of saying more than just papers, right? When they were saying, acknowledging, he's acknowledging, she's saying, well, we're not one of them, we're not like them. And then he says, we are now. Yeah. And I have the impre had the impression that, um, that they were <clears throat> kind of talking about more than just the papers, mm -hmm. the absence of the papers or having the papers. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think they're talking about the way that other people are gonna perceive them mm -hmm. now. Um, again, it's, it's like all kind of embedded in there, but it's a lot of the things that I was thinking about in terms of that particular issue as I was writing. And then you were talking a little bit about also um, coming here, you know, adopting some of the cultural, social, psychological mm -hmm. attributes of the United States while at the same time holding on to things that you may have left behind. And I think that to me came from seeing firsthand my dad as I was growing up and really sort of having this sense of empathy for him and I think he has a real struggle, you know, like he has been here for more than 40 years now and yet he still doesn't fully feel like he fits in in the United States. Like there are a lot of people I think who he still thinks make fun of his accent um, when he's doing a presentation at work. Um, I think that, you know, he has never totally fit, felt like he understands like American guys mm -hmm. and like the whole ethos of whatever. I mean, my dad's not like a sports guy or, you know, like he just doesn't have certain things in common with American guys and I think he's always struggling to find the middle ground. Um, and yeah, when he goes back to Panama, he doesn't totally feel like he fits in there anymore either. Yes. You know, like the country has changed so much since he last lived there. So if someone were to stop him and ask him for directions, for example, he doesn't really know anymore, mm -hmm. you know, if that certain landmark is there or if, mm -hmm. you know, the street name has even changed or whatever it is. So I think it's really hard for him to be in between and I've always seen that and I've been very sensitive to it and I guess I was thinking about that a lot in terms of you know how much of a new culture do you take on and embrace as your own because I think I mean I know he would say the United States is his home mm -hmm. but at the same time he feels that Panama is his home mm -hmm. you know and it's like I also think it's so interesting that we we tend to want to force people to choose or something, as if you can't have two homes. I mean, you can. It doesn't have to be a singular place. Um, but I think a lot of people feel like they have to decide where do they belong, one place or the other, when in truth, you know, you can belong in multiple places, all sort of at the same time. Um, so I guess, yeah, I was thinking a lot about that and some of the things that they were going through. Okay. Um, do you see or think that, um, all immigrants face pretty much the same kinds of <coughs> issues and problems and so on that we have uh, some of the characters in the book you know are dealing with of course issues like employment and education and all of that do you think that in general that all immigrants are facing the same kinds of issues no I mean I would hate to generalize anything I think that you know everyone has their own particular issues but I do think and, and not even just as immigrants, but as human beings, we're all trying to figure out that sense of belonging. Like you all, everybody wants to figure out where do they fit in, who do they connect to, who are their people, where's their place, you know? I just think that's true of anybody, whether or not you're an immigrant or, you know, mm -hmm. you could have been born and raised in California and still not be quite figuring it out, you know? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's, in, it's interesting, those, um, the differences, because one of the things that I thought about too was that 
given uh, the foundation of the country, I go back to the, the European reality, that there are ways that uh, many of us um, kind of remain foreign to a certain extent, even born here and generations of being here, um, because there are certain aspects that just don't, um, don't exactly overlap, you know, in terms of um, some of the kinds of things where your characters are trying to figure out uh, well, what is the right behavior in this situation, or how do we manage this, you know? And I'm thinking right now of this scene with Alma when she goes to the police station to say, you know, this boy has messed with my girl, so to speak. And, uh, and she's not clear about, is this an okay way to deal with this kind of situation? And I think um, that that sort of comes out of, um, there's a different way that the Euro reality teaches us to deal with certain situations like what you keep to yourself within the family, what you reach out words to share and try to get assistance from others. And so it's an interesting kind of dynamic to, to think about in general as far as immigrant groups and yeah. how immigrant groups handle different issues and how the community that they're integrating into uh, embrace or, or do not embrace, et cetera, and don't make it easy or yeah. helpful. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I think every group has its own rules, mm -hmm. you know, and the group can be small or the group can be large, and you're always, when you're new to the group, whatever it is, you're always trying to navigate and figure out what those rules are so that you can, you know, <coughs> not feel like so much of an outsider. And that can be true, like, in your own family, even, you know? Um, like, Mayor doesn't feel particularly like he fits in even within his own family, and he's trying to figure out and navigate the rules of that group even, you know, and all the things that his father wants for him that he's not living up to, and um, stuff like that, and I think, so, but being an immigrant, I think you have a whole other layer on top of it then, you know, because a lot of times you don't know the language, and obviously that's a huge barrier, or, you know, um, just other things, but... I think that that's probably true just of being in any kind of group setting. And again, I think it's just part of, you know, the dilemma and the challenge of being human. I mean, you know, if you find somebody who you feel like really understands you and really gets you, like that's super rare, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think, yeah, we're all going through life trying to figure that out. So uh, a novel question, uh, specifically. I noticed uh, a symmetry in the beginning and the ending of the novel. So I'm wondering if there was, I'm sure it was intentional, and I'm wondering what the, um, what the, the purpose was in terms of the, the message that you wanted to offer. And I'm being a little vague, you guys, for those of you who may not have finished the book yet. <laughs> I don't want to give it all away. But, but there is a symmetry. In terms of? The coming and the going. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's, um, there's a journey, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and there is, and it comes up near the end of the book, too, that this idea of whether return can also mean rebirth, mm -hmm. you know. And there's a lot of interplay between moving backwards and moving forwards and what does it mean. And, all of that kind of stuff. I, yeah, I hesitate to say too much either because I don't want to <laughs> give any spoilers. But right. yeah, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's weird when you're writing a book because you start off thinking you're writing about one thing, and then as you're writing, it becomes about like eight million other things. <laughs> and you're trying to figure out really just a way to like rein it all in and make sense of it all. Um, but that ended up, you know, it became the book became to me about blame in ways that I didn't expect, and it became to me about that movement between past and present, backwards and forwards, um, in a way that I also didn't anticipate. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it was pretty, well, <coughs> oh, okay. Do you have a Are question? We ready? Yes, well. So did you have an outline of the book in mind when you started writing it, or did it just all develop no, I usually... Well, let's repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, is the, the question was, is there an outline when I started writing, or did it develop organically? Thank you for reminding me. Um, and usually when I start a project, I try to know as little as possible going into it, um, which is actually a really 
frightening way to write. Because <laughs> you have no idea what, you know, you have no safety net under you. You're just sort of blindly walking forward. And I really only know about a sentence ahead of me. I mean, that's it. You know, like I write a sentence, and then another one grows out of that, and another one grows out of that. And it, it's, you're really just putting it down on paper um, as you go. For a novel, what I've learned now is what I try to do is do that for about 50 pages. And just let it take me where it's going and follow my own interests and my own instincts and not try to dictate you know, the kind of story that it's going to be or not try to force the characters in one direction or another, but just actually really follow it. And then after about 50 pages, I stop and I kind of look at what I've got. And then I try to see, OK, what could be the natural shape of this as a book? You know, How could this kind of develop? And then I start sort of plotting out and outlining. But when I outline, I mean, it's really it's super loose. It's like, I just, it's just a list of scenes that I know need to happen, kind of. Um, you know, like, Alma will go to the police station. Alma will do this. Maribel will do this. Like, whatever it is. And I don't really know exactly how they're going to unfold or who's going to. It's not intricate in any way. It's really just kind of like guideposts for me. Um, but that has been working really pretty well so far. Um, again, the hard thing is that you just feel like you're basically flinging yourself off a cliff and you have no <laughs> idea if it's going to work or not. Um, but I have found that when I know everything before I start, those stories are much flatter. Um, you have a sense as a reader, I think, that I, as the author, am behind the scenes being a puppet master and then I'm manipulating something somehow. And I think it comes off as inorganic. It comes off as less surprising um, and less dynamic, you know. Um, and I think. So as scary as it is, the payoff is enough to keep going and you know do it that way, just a line at a time. So like I started with that line, we heard they were from Mexico. And then I'm like, well, are they from Mexico? I don't know. So then the next line is, definitely, my mom said. I mean, at this point, I had no narrator. I didn't know what was happening. And then I wrote, definitely, my mom said. And it's like, OK, well, I guess I have a young narrator now, because he said my mom, right? I still didn't actually know, was it a boy or a girl narrator? Like, you just, you're kind of, it sounds like a really weird way to do it, but you're just <coughs> casting out lines, and you're just following them the whole way. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So, <coughs> any other, yes? Yeah, the question is um, a little bit more about my background and how I became a writer. And um, I will, I'll start by saying I was always a reader. I think you know most writers I know we start as just really really passionate readers, and I was that reader who would you know come home from elementary school with the Scholastic book order form, and I would have like circled <laughs> all of the books that I wanted to read and beg my parents to buy them for me. Um, and to their credit, they would. They would buy you know, basically everything that we could afford. And so I was always a reader as a kid. But it wasn't until I was in high school that I realized kind of that I wanted to be a writer or that I liked writing in any way. Um, and the story behind that is, and it starts as many stories do, with a boy <laughs> who I liked. We were friends. I wanted to be more than friends. And I spent a lot of time in high school trying to tell him how I felt about him. So I would, you know, be at a party somewhere and I would like get him into a corner and I would say, <laughs> I really like you. And then I would like call him late at night after my parents were in bed and I would tell him, you know, I really like you. <laughs> and he got really sick of it. And he came into school one day with a blank journal that he handed to me. And he said, why don't you write down everything you want to say to me for a year, and then give this back to me. <laughs> and I said, sure. So I took it home, and I started writing all those entries that were really at first just to him, 
you know, they were like, how great he looked in Caculus that day or whatever. I, mean, <laughs> I, I like really liked him because he was so smart. Um, like we would sometimes play Scrabble together and he would play words like bivouac. And I was just like, oh my god, you're amazing, <laughs> you know. This is the nerdy word girl in me. Um, so I would write these entries and then after about three weeks, I realized how much I loved just sitting down at the end of every day and writing. Just the simple act of sitting down and writing and recording my day and playing with language and doing anything I wanted to do and saying anything I wanted to say and being anybody I wanted to be in those pages. And so I kept writing in the journal for a year and I did give it back to him and nothing happened between the two of us. <laughs> he read it, he thanked me for it. Um, but we're still friends now, and a few years ago he gave it back to me. So I have it now, and it's really, really embarrassing and cringeworthy to look at. But it's also a really nice document, you know, of a time that was very formative for me in my life and in my career. Um, and I basically never looked back from that moment. You know, like I finished that journal and then I bought another one for myself and I filled it up and then I bought another one and I filled it up and I, I mean, I really don't think I've like stopped writing in any significant way since then. Um, so I think, you know, basically what had happened was at the end of the year I had fallen out of love with the boy and I had fallen in love with writing instead. So um, I really, I think I pinpoint that as the moment you know, when I realized kind of the role that writing would play in my life. But I studied creative writing in undergraduate, and then I got my MFA in creative writing, you know, not without a lot of rejections along the way, though, to schools and, you know, then in terms of sending out stories and trying to get books published and stuff like that. There was a lot of twists and turns along the way. But, you know, if you want something badly enough, or if it's, like, in you, deeply enough, you just keep going for it. And I feel like that was, you know, suddenly sort of the thing with me. So I kept going and yeah, now here I am get to talk to you guys today. <laughs> so thanks for your question. Other questions? Oh, okay. So how do you handle with, uh, when you have characters who speak more than one language? Like how do you go about, say like protagonist at, as I assume, those both say English and Spanish, how do you, portray that in a way so it's not confusing to say the reader? Um, yeah, the question is how, when I have a, a character who speaks more than one language, such as the protagonist in this book, Mayor, um, who speaks both English and Spanish, how do I sort of portray that um, or deal with that within the text? Um, I, you know, weirdly, I think I don't think about it very much. I mean, I think there's just a suspension of disbelief that I assume is going to happen with a reader. And the suspension is like, well, these characters are speaking Spanish most of the time, and yet you understand that at my own school, for example, the kids speak English and the teachers are speaking to him in English, and then that he's probably speaking in English in any of those scenes where you would see him in school. Um, and I think, so basically for me, I, like, I clarify it once, and then I let, let it go, you know? Um, I think the first scene where the Toros run into the... Rivera's at the Dollar Tree. Um, I think possibly, and I can't remember exactly, because again, I've done like 20 drafts of this book, but I have no idea what stayed in and what, <laughs> what got cut. But I think there is a part where it says that um, Celia, my or's mom, says something to Senora Rivera, and I think it says in Spanish, specifically. You know, just to like orient the reader and root them um, that this is a conversation that's happening in Spanish, and then, you know, you back off. You don't have to say anything else about it again. Um, and the only other time that I think it comes up in any overt way is when they're going to buy a car um, that Mayor's dad has always, always wanted his whole life to own a car, and they finally go and buy one. And his dad takes him with him because his dad is convinced, and this is something I stole from my dad, that there are different languages for different realms of life. And so he's like, I know English well enough for my job, but I don't know the English of cars, <laughs> you know? So you have to come with me, son, because you have to help and your English is better than mine. And 
Um, my dad's always saying that kind of thing, that he knows English in certain realms, but not others. Um, which is not actually even true, but it's just his own <laughs> self-consciousness. Um, but yeah, so there's the part in there where it's clear that Mayor is speaking English for his parents, and also that Rafa, his dad, tries to speak English at one point. And when his dad tries to speak English, I did do it so that it's a little bit broken English, you know, so that you can tell um, that it's not native for him in the way, it's not native for Mayor either, but it's very natural for Mayor at least, yeah. So I was on that, that note as well, um, the language, I noticed that there were points that you chose to have the character speak in Spanish and you wrote it, you know, the phrases or sentences or what have you. Um, why? Um, yes. Let's I, I usually include the Spanish if I feel that in some way it's untranslatable, mm -hmm. the essence of it. Um, otherwise, I, I try not to put it in. And, and also, you know, it was a big decision. Do are we going to italicize the Spanish or not? Mm -hmm. And I really pushed for not italicizing it, which you know, fortunately, the publisher went with. I felt like it was just the more seamless presentation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't otherize the Spanish so much. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, even in the scene that I read, the Christmas scene, you know, just a simple word like his mom says, Benny, Ving. To me, if she had said, Benny, come here, mm -hmm. like it's just a really different yes. feel to that, a different sound. Um, I don't know, so sometimes there are things that just the essence of them feels untranslatable, and then I include them in Spanish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the audience? Okay. With, with all the stories, did you write them separately, or did you, like each narrator, did you do yeah. that each one separately in full, or did you break them up and put it together and as it together? Yeah, the question is, for all the different narrators, did I write them all separately, or did I write them all sort of together? Uh, the way that I wrote the book was, I had one file going, that was for Mayor and Alma's story, the main storyline. And then I had a totally separate file that was all the neighbor voices. So that I could keep them separate. And at one point, I mean, for a long time actually, I had the idea that I would stick all the neighbor voices at the very end of the book. And that in doing so, my idea was they would function as sort of a chorus. But somebody pointed out to me that the plot of the book would be done by then. So there was a really good chance that readers were just going to gloss over all of these voices at the end, and that was heartbreaking to me because my whole point of including them was for them to be heard. Mm -hmm. So I went back and tried to figure out how to slot them all in, and it's not very elegant. Like there's, it's, there's no really great logistical way of doing it, but I thought by keeping them all short at least, they're all only two to three pages at most, um, that it wouldn't disrupt the main narrative you know, too much, hopefully. So, yeah, but that was the way, kind of, that I went about it. I loved it. I, at first, when I started reading, I thought it was a bunch of short stories, and then, I, and then it linked back around together. Yeah. So I, Thank you. Yeah, um, the comment was that they sort of read as, like, short stories at first. It, I like that you said that, because I think I'm a short story writer at heart, and I think it was partly my way of, like my imposter novelist way of writing a novel, you know what I mean? Um, like I don't think I can, it's hard for me to conceive of a novel unless it's, there's some kind of really rigid structure behind it. And for me, that provided some of the structure. So, yeah. I think this is our last question. Go ahead. I just want to circle back to the language issue because it touches every immigrant population. There could be Chinese and Korean. And, and Spanish, is, of course, is very widely speaking, so maybe most people in Milan understand it, even if it's Spanish. But it, it, would you say that you also do it just because that you want to create a barrier for people who are really, let's say, anglo saxon They actually don't speak Spanish, and then it's kind of like a cultural barrier. Is that the intention, or it's just more... It's more like because it's natural. Because can you apply the same rule for other languages if you write about other immigrants? Right. Um, so the question is about, again, including the Spanish. Um, and in doing that, it, it, is part of the intention there perhaps 
to create some kind of barrier for anybody who doesn't speak the language yeah, to feel that distance. I don't think so. I, I think I'm actually interested in quite the opposite, which is, which is um, dismantling any kind of barriers or separations. Um, I think it really, for me, was really just about um, honoring the characters who I was writing from and did it make sense that they were going to say something. And there's, there's actually so little Spanish that I didn't ever worry or feel that it would be alienating in any way to anybody um, or act as some kind of barrier. Um, I mean, language is something that I think about quite a bit. I mean, it's my job, but I also, in terms of Spanish and English, think about it quite a bit because I don't speak fluent Spanish. Um, and people are often surprised to hear that. And I always think it's funny that they're surprised <laughs> that. I, I mean, I guess I understand it given my last name and what I write about, but um, it's, it was not something that was spoken in my house when I was growing up. Um, you know, and I think my parents regret that now, and I know that I wish that I knew it better. Um, but, yeah, I think for me, it's almost the opposite. Including those things is kind of a way almost for me just as an author to feel reconnected to that part of my heritage stuff. Yeah, instead of being a barrier. Thank you guys so much for coming and staying and listening. Thank you. Yes.